joining us for this webinar on uh, resources for service providers, family, and caretakers of children who are hard of hearing. We'll begin in a few moments, but in the meantime, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. We're waiting for a few more participants to get onto the webinar platform. Hi, good afternoon. Um, again, this is Sarah Shannon. I'm the Executive Director at Hesperian Health Guides, and it's my pleasure to have everyone joining us today for a webinar on resources for service providers, family and caretakers of children who are hard of hearing. And um, again, just a moment of housekeeping. We do have all participants muted, um, but we're asking and encouraging you to um, Submit any questions or comments that you have throughout the webinar, and we will be taking those questions periodically by typing them into the comment box on the right-hand side of, this, of your screen. Um, and uh, my colleague Robin Young will be uh, watching for those and conveying them and, and reading them out loud on, in, to the webinar group so everyone can see them and hear them. Okay, well, thank you again. Um, and. Um, Okay, great. <laughs> now that we're getting set with the slides, um, again, this is a webinar on resources for service providers, family, and caretakers of children who are hard of hearing. And it's my great pleasure to have with us three really excellent speakers today. Um, you can see them listed here. Um, briefly, what we're going to be doing is I will give a bit of an overview of uh, Hesperian's uh, resources, particularly helping children who are deaf. Um, that are available to support uh, service providers, family, and caretakers. And um, then we're going to be hearing from Lorraine, uh, Halisa, and Melissa, who are going to share their different experiences of working with children who are hard of hearing and using these resources in that context. I'll wrap up with some uh, in specific information and tips about accessing this, re this free information online. Okay. I can't. Um, so a brief overview about Hesperian Health Guides is that uh, we have actually been around since the early 70s. Our best known book is Where There Is No Doctor, which has been used all over the world and has been translated into over 80 languages. What we're really known for is producing accessible, easy-to-use, community-based information that people can uh, find accessible in terms of the information they're provided and use it to make, to act upon uh, at, a, at a family level and a community level to improve health uh, for themselves and for community members. What we'd like to speak about today is helping children who are deaf, um, a resource for parents and caregivers and family members of uh, children who are deaf. This publication is, uh, was, as all Hesperian publications, field tested by parents, teachers, deaf adults, and health workers from 17 countries. While it was developed for international use, it's also been used and was tested and developed here for use in the United States. Um, it's particularly useful in the U.S. for non-English speakers, although it is used in many different programs. One of the uh, key goals of this publication is to um, help, help people that are working with young deaf children uh, learn how to communicate. And one of the big challenges that we experienced while developing this and that parents and, and caregivers and field testers helped us do was to, to uh, work on demystifying the theory of how language acquisition drives cognitive development and so social skills development, as well as providing parents and family members with information about how they can support the overall integrated development of their child. Um, we're going to be looking later at um, this resource in an online format um, that is now available in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese, and will soon be available in other languages online. It's available in print in over 18 languages. All of Hesperian's materials, including this, start from a caveat of really starting from people's experience and validating that experience. Um, we often use stories to help connect readers uh, and help them sort of, and help validate the reality that they experience. And certainly, uh, the experience of 
a parent being uh, concerned about how they're really going to be able to communicate with a child with, who is hard of hearing is certainly a universal concern. Hesperian publications and this publication in particular also focus on offering very practical solutions um, and prioritizing the kinds of uh, solutions that are really beneficial in it. And, and things that parents and ca caregivers can do. Here's some examples. The materials are designed um, based on uh, user feedback, um, and a great deal of effort is put into collecting feedback from all, uh, all sorts of end users, ranging from deaf adults to parents and family members of deaf children and children who are hard of hearing community health workers, health educators, uh, teachers, um, and folks that are running programs. So um, that level of support and feedback has been uh, collected and reflected in the end result here. You can see some uh, information here as an example that sort of that focuses on the action-oriented uh, level of this material which is really designed to encourage participation and action. We try and focus um, in a way that encourages critical thinking um, and enables parents to think about and adapt the information they've been presented upon and also to not rely on high levels of literacy. So that's an overview of uh, Helping Children Who Are Deaf, which is, uh, has been a print resource um, widely used and recently now made available in an online format. Um, our, we're going to hear now from uh, three different speakers, and our first speaker is Lorraine Brott, and it's really a privilege to have her join us. Um, Lorraine is an audiologist with a focus on newborn hearing screening, infant diagnostics, and educational follow-up. Um, she has uh, spent Many years now focused on pediatrics and early diagnosis and intervention, and Lorraine was also a reviewer of the Helping Children Who Are Deaf materials as they were being developed. We're really thrilled to have her share her perspective on uh, these materials and on this, on this work. Thanks, Sarah. It's, it's very nice to be here. Um, I don't work as in the trenches as, as the next two speakers do. Um, but it is very important work to me, and I think this resource and the, the kind of an adaptation of this resource from being a, a published physical book into something accessible um, online is, is, a big, is a big deal. Um, as Sarah said, I, I have quite a bit of experience in pediatrics. That is my love. I do have about 30 years of experience in audiology, which dates me a little bit. Um, but my focus really, especially in the last 10 years, has been on, you know, early diagnosis, early intervention, newborn hearing screening, um, and getting these families um, information that they need to, to work on, like Sarah was saying, language development and accessibility. Um, a lot of us take for granted how that system works. Um, a lot of people in general take for granted how that system works. Um, and, you know, recently you'll, you'll, you've seen more ads and there have been things in the media about talking to your baby, you know, telling them what you're doing, things like that. Um, and I think it's really specifically more important to work on that with our families of babies that are diagnosed with hearing loss. Um, and in the Bay Area, we have the additional challenge of having a lot of multilingual families, and really in the state of California, um, as well as across the nation, but my focus has really been in California, um, has been the issue of, of, of families where English is not always spoken in the home. And to find good information for those parents, to find information that is trusted to be translated appropriately, um, those kinds of things have been a struggle um, here as we look at trying to support families. So I was very excited to see this um, publication, not just as a publication, but as I said, as something that's now turned into a really instantly accessible uh, piece of information, as an instantly accessible resource. Um, and the two things that come to mind, and while I'm not using it directly with families, but you know, for us, 
um, as we think about we've made these diagnoses, we've sent these families into the early intervention world or working with those, is, is that idea of, you know, in certain locations, and it's not the same here in the U.S., but we, we, we always have interpretive services when we're, we're working with these families, but having that information in tandem. So I, as an audiologist, or I, as an early interventionist, can look at the information or the resource in my native language and then look and, and focus it with the family. So we can be looking at the same page or the same thing at the same time and using that together as we're working together. Um, and again, that it's always accessible um, so that, that this information can be brought up, can be used um, instantly wherever they are, um, wherever the families are. We work quite a bit. Um, in California with um, immigrant families and also migrant families. So families that are moving around, we, you know, get them connected locally for their, with their early intervention services, with their, with their um, teachers and all of that, and then, you know, they have to move because their work next month is in Southern California or is in the Central Valley or is somewhere else. And so they, they kind of hop around quite a bit. And so something that they have that's accessible that they can then take with them as they move around and can refer back to, oh, that's right, the teacher was saying something. What was she saying? They can go back to that and take that with them as they go. Um, as I said, I'm not the one in the trenches. Um, as, as the next two presenters are. Um, so I want to turn it over to them and, and it, they can give you more specific ways in which they're using this, this great resource with their families. Thank you, Lorraine. And I know that folks are going to have lots of questions for you um, and about your work. Um, it is indeed an, an honor and a pleasure to, um, to have two speakers that are associated with the Center for Early Intervention on Deafness, CEID. Um, and our first of these speakers is, is, um, is Halisa Katz, um, and she, uh, she and CEID have had an important role in um, both developing, helping children who are deaf originally as a book um, where they reviewed the content, and more recently in developing the mobile-friendly tablet technology, uh, tablet-friendly um, online version. Uh, CEID helped us beta test the online version and gave us a great deal of useful feedback about how to make sure that the ways that uh, it, the information was presented were really user-friendly and really meeting the needs of both uh, home visitors and um, parents and caregivers. So it is a great pleasure to uh, introduce Halisa. And um, again, we're really honored to have her. Halisa, as you can see, has an extensive background, um, and it's really a pleasure um, this slide gives just a little bit of what Felicia brings in terms of expertise. Um, and uh, she's been working now with CEID for 11 years and has held a variety of positions. Again, we're really pleased to have Felicia join us. Hi, this is Felicia, and I'm glad to be able to join you here for the webinar today. And um, so I've been at SEED for many years now and I've been in a variety of positions always working with children and their families and uh, primarily as a home visitor where I'm working with families from the time the children are just diagnosed they could just be a couple weeks old all the way up until they're getting ready to go into kindergarten at that age and so what I find the first couple years working with families is parents are really hungry for resources and they're looking for all kinds of multimedia resources. So apps, um, online reading, websites, articles, books, talking to other people. And so they're really wanting to find different ways that they can get information that's not just from a medical professional. Often the medical information uh, has terminology that's a little bit more difficult to understand and it's not practical on the day-to-day -day level how you can deal with your family, with your neighborhood, with your extended family, um, with your teachers, just information that's at a more easily digestible level. So I found that using the books and the online resources 
were really nice for the families. Um, one, because a lot of families who maybe don't speak English would have that option to, um, for example, um, use the resources in Spanish. Or families that are in the U.S. and have extended family, maybe in another country, and they want their extended family to understand what their family is going through, and so they could easily send a link to a family member who may be in Mexico, and they can access that information also. So one way that I work with families um, in getting access to online materials is through our iPad lending program. We got a grant a few years ago to purchase uh, five iPads and also get internet access for them so they could use them as a mobile device. And so for families who didn't necessarily have a computer at home, and we found a lot of our families actually didn't, especially our families that were non-English speaking families, they may not have smartphones, they may not have computers, and um, they may not have access to print materials that were in their language. So through our iPad program, I was able to go to their home, kind of walk them through the resources, and as well as the, the speaker before me said, look at it in my native language and then say, oh, and then here it is in Spanish. And so we'd be able to talk about it in that situation. Also, parents often say, we're running around from appointment to appointment. You know, I could, I could bring my tablet or my smartphone and just look up a quick reference if I want to. And it was right there in the palm of their hand. So that was another thing that was really helpful for them. So with the iPads, if a family wanted to borrow the iPad, they were able to check it out for two weeks at a time. So that was another way that they would have access to the online resource without having a computer or internet access at their home. So one thing that I also felt that was helpful that parents commented on were that the materials were really emphasizing how to make language visual, visual for children. And it wasn't so much about all the medical appointments and all the doctor's appointments they needed to go to, but um, how to ensure that their child is going to pick up language. So meeting deaf people, learning the language of the deaf community, making everything visual. Even if you don't know sign language, you know, how can you make up home signs? Or what can you do to emphasize and work on a specific concept with your child so they're going to be able to understand it right there in the moment. And so it was very practical, very user friendly, and again the, the pictures in the book and on online were the were more like a comic book format. And so it it made you feel like you were getting to watch another family, kind of like you're peering into their living room. And so it was much easier for families to connect to it and feel like somebody else was having their, a similar experience. And so altogether, I felt like the response from being able to take, take it on the go, use the iPads, and really make it part of their understanding and their extended family's understanding of what their child is going to need, it was just really a positive experience for everybody. Folks will have some questions. Oh, thank you so much, Felisa, for that overview. And I know that folks will have some questions about uh, your work, CEID's work, and also some of the innovative uh, uses of technology that CEID has been employing over the last few years. Um, mm -hmm. Before we open it up for more questions, though, we'd love to hear from Melissa Lopez, who mm -hmm. Uh, who is a parent and um, volunteer with CEID. And um, so it's a great honor to have Melissa joining us as well. We have this beautiful picture of Melissa and her daughter, who, Maria, who's now age seven. Um, and Melissa's been a parent advocate. She's uh, volunteered with CEID, and she's been a great support to other parents navigating the service system for their children, which, as everyone knows, can be very challenging. So, Melissa, um, we'd love to hear a little bit from you as well. Thank you. Um, this is Melissa, and I'll start with the background of Maria, how we came to find out Maria was deaf. So she was born premature, and she ended up staying in the NICU for about, I think it was 99 days. And 
didn't actually do a newborn hearing screening until the day before she was going to be released from the hospital. She had so many other health issues that um, that got put on the back burner. And she did fail three times before we left the hospital. But really, to me, for me to get that information at that time was, it, it didn't sink in all the way. There was, like I said, there was a lot of other things going on with her. So I got to bring her home and we actually, we had, we had scheduled, I'm sorry, an ABR. And that was our next step. Actually, let me go back. Our next step was to go to the audiologist at Children's Hospital and try to do the sleep study again where she would sleep and they could just hook her up to the electrodes. That didn't work. She wouldn't go to sleep for them, so we did have to schedule an ABR. And with her health issues, uh, we didn't end up doing the ABR till she was nearly a year old. And at that point is when we found out she had a profound to severe hearing loss. And still, I think, hearing that news, it's it's real shocking as a parent, and I honestly don't think I completely understood what it meant at that time. Once we found out she had that hearing loss, we were set up to do a hearing aid trial, which you have to do before. We knew that she would get to the cochlear implant trial, but we had to do the hearing aid trial first, so we did that. And I believe it was around that time that we started getting the home visits from SEED, which were just amazing for me. You're, you're at home with this child and you can take care of this child physically. She had several follow-up appointments. We were at the hospital a lot just for her follow-up appointments for her lungs and for her heart and for other things. Audiology became a part of that where it was a regular, we would regularly go there for appointments. Um, we got a lot of support from Children's Hospital and also from C from our home visitor. And our home visitor would come once a week and do like a play therapy, which is really the only kind of therapy you can do with a child <laughs> at that age. But it was wonderful. And it's, it just opened my eyes to a whole new world of, um, it was hard for me to, to, to really accept the fact that my daughter was deaf, not because I didn't want to, but because she was so expressive and she was always watching people and engaging people. And so it was just hard to believe that she wasn't hearing everything and able to understand what, what was going on around her. So after we had home visits for about a year, she was, um, and we did the hearing aid trial, she still did not hear enough to learn language. So we went to the cochlear implant team, and we had to go through a process for that. And she was implanted with her first implant in July of 2008, so she was almost two, and she got activated in August 2008. And that was extremely exciting and fun to experience. It's nerve-wracking, the actual operation, but it's not very long. And just the outcome was amazing. We started SEED in the toddler class in September of 2008. So she wasn't even really two years old yet and already starting school. And that's what you see a lot of around here is these kids are so young, but they really need that exposure and that experience to be around people. Like the people at this center at SEED can give you so much knowledge and just it takes a big weight off your shoulders because you can really see how we're supposed to work with our children or what works with our children and there's so many different ways to do it and just watching they have two-way mirrors where you can watch the classroom I'm pretty sure for the first year I didn't leave that that library that parent library <laughs> where you get to just watch your child and you're involved in sign language classes once a week you're invited to watch their speech therapy and there is just the amount of support is amazing and also then so when you're in that library for the first year because you don't want to leave your child there you meet the other parents and then that's also where some magic happens because you've been through similar things and and you make connections and we support each other and I've had I've had relationships that started here at SEED back then that I still have now and we kind of have our, our small group of us that stay together and we still do play dates and things like that so our kids know they aren't the only ones out there with CIs or hearing loss. So she went to SEED for three years. She was two years in the toddler class and one year in the preschool class. And as it was coming to the end of her time here at SEED, I began, I began volunteering. I just I like to help people. And so if they needed help in the office or in the classrooms with anything, I would always offer to help. And once she left SEED, she, which is a whole other thing that you have to go through with your child who's deaf and hard of hearing, is then you have to navigate the school districts and the school systems. But that's a whole other subject. I'll stick with what I'm talking about. So I started volunteering. She graduated from SEED. And once she was not here, I was able to work more in the classroom 
because kids will act differently when their parents are around than they do when the parents are not around. So I started working just as a volunteer aide, and and really I don't have any background in early childhood, um, early childhood background, but what I have is the experience then that I've had the last few years with Maria and learning the sign language and just learning from watching everybody here at SEED. So then I started to become, I was actually a paid teacher's aide, and it started out as like a substitute, but then the need grew, so I was needed more often, and I've been doing that now. I think this is my third steady year. I, I've worked the last two years as a one-on-one -on -one aide with one child, and then this year I'm working one-on-one -on -one with another child. But I've done several things here at SEED, and one of the best things about SEED, they are here for the children, but they're also here for the adults as well. It's very open and, and home. It's like a second home for me and if you want that if you need that that's here for you if other people's experience might not be the same but it's what you're whatever you're ready for and what you feel like you can do at that time and that's different for everybody I was part of the uh, beta testing and it was very interesting I'd never done anything like that before but what I liked most about the beta testing was just the easy access to maneuvering around. When I did it, I didn't have the book yet. We just did it on the on the computer, on the iPad. And it was very easy to maneuver and to read. I was even more happy, actually, though, when I did see the book, because just leafing through it, it has so many. I like the stories that explain to you, the, you know, the family stories. The little, it's not like a cartoon, but it has the pictures and the captions. That really, that helps. It brings it down to a level where everybody could understand it. And had I had that sooner, it might have made a difference uh, in it might have helped me a little bit more. Not that I, when when you're home with a child and and you don't have any of that information, you have a person who comes once a week, and that's great. But then that person's gone, and you're there with that child for another six days, and it's just not always easy to continue to do what you've been taught to do. And also, it's just not as imprinted in you as it is once you come to the center and you see it in place. Then it becomes a part of your life, and it's difficult if you're a, if you're a hearing parent. With a deaf child, you really, you don't have a lot. Of, I've never had experience with deafness, and there's just there's a lot to learn. But I did like the way that this book was laid out, and it was very easy to understand. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. And I do want to just uh, appreciate the really integrated approach that CEID takes. I think they're a wonderful model of. Um, of a really integrated family-focused approach to supporting um, children with uh, who are hard of hearing, and it's just been a pleasure to be partnering with CEID. Um, why don't we open it up for some questions at this point? Um, we do have a couple questions right now, um, and perhaps this one is for Lorraine. Um, one attendee wants to know what the best way to introduce a deaf child to American Sign Language for the first time. By signing. Um, you know, that's in any language, whether it be spoken language or sign language, you want to just start signing. Um, start speaking, whatever you're going to use, and you want to do that immediately. That's really, from my perspective, the whole idea of early identification is early intervention and starting that immediately. I don't think there's any magic, um, magic, um, you know, uh, trick to that. And maybe, maybe Halisa, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Hi, this is Halisa. Just as children pick up spoken language naturally by having it used around them, the same is the same is true for sign language. So, the only difference is. With a child who can't hear, you need to make sure that they see you. A child who can hear can overhear you when you're in the other room. They can overhear conversations that you're having. And a child who can't hear doesn't have that option. So if you're going to sign with your child, make sure that you know, there's not a lot of things going on in the background. Get their attention first. Get their eye contact first. And use it in real life situations. And so you're talking about what the child is actually interested, what the child is looking at. And then just start showing them some signs. So if they're, if they're playing with a toy, a ball, for example, um, you may want to just get down to their level, make eye contact with them, 
and just sign to them, oh, you know, you have a ball, or roll the ball. And then once they know ball, you can start to add in other words like roll and bounce and big and small. But you know, vocabulary grows depending on how much vocabulary you have as a base to begin with. So use it consistently and repetitively and work it into daily routines. I always tell parents to start signing about what they do every single day with their child. So for example, eating, diaper changing, uh, maybe going in the car, um, taking a bath, going to bed, all of those daily routines are a perfect way to build language in. And um, it also really helps for some parents who are, who are going to forget to have a visual. So a printout of a picture of a sign of diaper, for example, um, taped above the diaper changing table or a picture on the child's high chair that says eat. That's just another reminder for the adult who is going to be communicating with the child to use those signs and to use them in context. And we see that kids who are exposed to a good role model who's using sign language, their language development is very typical. It, it might not be that they're using spoken languages, but you see the spoken language, but you see the same kinds of language features that you would in a child who was using a spoken language. So they can ask questions, they can use tenses, they can use plurals, they can uh, retell a story, all of those things that you would expect. Um, from typical language acquisition, you can get the exact same with sign language. Great, thank you. Um, and one more uh, question for you, Halisa. Um, an attendee says, I love the idea of the iPads as a portable resource. How do you ensure the families return the iPads? So when the families come to borrow an iPad, we take their credit card information. So <laughs> they know that in two weeks, if they they also have to sign a release form, and so we know that if they don't return it, that we can charge their credit card. So that is that is incentive for them. We don't just give it to anybody and bring it and leave it at somebody's house. They do actually have to, you know, give us that information ahead of time. And so often, if I'm going to a family's house for a home visit, I will pick it up and take it back with me, so they don't actually have to come here. But for the for the kids who come here and are in our, who are in our center-based program, the parents will go check them out and um, we have their, we know where they live, basically. <laughs> we have their address and their, their financial information. Great, great, good questions. We're going to be taking a break in a few more minutes for some more questions and I think some discussion among the different presenters. Um, but let me just do a fast uh, kind of tutorial in uh, using this online version of Helping Children Who Are Deaf that, again, was um, actually beta tested by the help, with the help of uh, parents and home visitors and other staff from CEID um, who helped us uh, develop the way that information is presented. Um, it is in a, uh, something that we call the Help Wiki. It's a now mobile-friendly, very searchable, wiki-based format um, that's particularly useful with slow internet connections, although it's useful for all. Um, and here's a little overview of some of the other ways that uh, this information is available, and I'll be going over that now. Um, there's been a couple of references to uh, the images, and it was, my goodness, <laughs> I'm going to take a break for an overhead plane. <laughs> All right, uh, there's been a couple of references to uh, the images and illustrations in uh, Helping Children Who Are Deaf. Um, here's a couple of examples of them, and um, they, they in fact are uh, often repurposed and copied or printed out and might serve as some of the examples that uh, I think Lisa was suggesting um, can also help, but they also model and demonstrate and remind parents uh, how to be signing for uh, and help reinforce language acquisition for their child. Um, these images are also available not just in the wiki platform, but also in an online library of images that Hesperian hosts on our website and which can be downloaded uh, so that they can be reused for other purposes. Um, the uh, main body of this online information is in the Help Wiki, um, which 
currently has content now in 13 languages and um, is receiving a great amount of traffic, about 16,000 visitors a day. Um, it is now mobile friendly, thanks in large part to the beta testing that we've done um, with helping children who are deaf, and it's searchable and easy to navigate. And I'll give some examples using helping children who are deaf, um, which is now available in four languages. And uh, stay tuned, because I think in the next few weeks, we will also be releasing it in two more. So right now, you can find and move across languages in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese. And coming soon is French and Lao. This is what you see when you uh, get to the sort of landing page for helping children who are deaf in the Help Wiki. Searching for information is, is quite easy, and there's a number of ways to do it. Um, one is to just simply use the table of contents and see the topics that are listed under each chapter or each segment, section. Uh, here's an example of what it looks like if you're looking at the table of contents. So, uh, for example, we can look at Chapter 1, and we can decide that what we're most interested in is information about why communication is important for children's development. We can get into that content, and then you can see where some of the other information is, and you can easily move around. You can also, once you're, oops, once you're in there, you can then switch to other languages, as a couple of the different uh, presenters have spoken about, um, which can be particularly useful when working with families who uh, English is not their first language or may not even be the language that they speak, and you're relying on translators. Um, another way you can just search is by using the search uh, bar at the top of the Help Wiki. So here's an example where we've typed in sign language, and you can see the different references to sign language throughout this uh, resource and uh, can easily navigate that way. Uh, you can always go back to the um, to the home, to the Health Wiki homepage or to the Helping Children's Children Who Are Deaf page to see the table of contents and navigate around that way as well. So um, I'm wondering if we have a few more questions that we can take. We sure do. Um, so this one is for all of our speakers. Um, what are some good early diagnostic methods that can help doctors or parents? in low-resource countries where they don't have tools such as iPads? Uh, let's see. <laughs> Any, anyone want to take that, or is that one me? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess I'm a little confused because this is Lorraine. Um, you know, usually, and I believe the, the, what we were talking about here and using the iPads is using the uh, the wiki access for the the guide. I don't know of any um, programs or, or diagnostic tools that are used through an iPad. They're generally done through the traditional methods. Um, for me, in thinking about you know those types of situations, it's it's really about kind of getting language going and so you know if, if there is a question and we always say caregiver concern is, is the first um, kind of sign that, that you need to do something and if there isn't access to say a diagnostic center or something is to to start some sign language with that with that child right away you know have those parents doing some basic signs um, while they're trying to figure out what's going on you know with actual hearing levels. Um, and maybe I'm not answering the question, but but I'm not sure that the, the iPad part is necessarily connected to the diagnostic. Right. I, I might just add that, um, and again, uh, when we were developing Helping Children Who Are Deaf, we, uh, we field tested the content in many different contexts and countries. Um, and uh, one of the things that really came through was the the strategies that people were using, which actually Halisa and um, Lorraine and Melissa have spoken to, about just establishing any kind of communication and helping your child acquire language in all ways possible while you're still figuring out you know, what might be the best strategy in the long run, um, what kinds of resources are available. And so I think, um, and one of the things that we worked really hard on doing was really helping family members understand the importance of that early language acquisition, no matter how you do it, and the importance of communication. Um, 
um, in all ways, um, and per particularly visual communication. So I, I guess I just want to reemphasize that, that it does not require a lot of high technology to do. And in fact, we saw some really amazing examples of folks doing it with very low technology, and some of those are included in the resource itself. All right, we can move on to the next question. Um, how effective is the HRR for newborn hearing screening? I think this one's for Lorraine. I think so, but I'm not sure what the HRR is. Um, maybe if the user could clarify. Could, could whoever posed that question just type a little bit more clarifying information into the comment box? And we can, in the meantime, we can move on to the other question. Um, how do you help children make the transition from sign language to reading text? Oh, good question. Elisa, perhaps you want to try that one? Hi, this is Elisa. Sure, I think the most important thing for kids before they begin to read is that they have a well-developed vocabulary. Because once you're learning to read, that's really a code for a language that you already have. And so if you're seeing a word and you don't know what that word actually is, no matter what strategies you're using to try to figure it out, if you don't know that vocabulary word, you're not going to be able to decode it. So making sure that the child has a very strong language foundation, you can use that to explain the text to the child and then start to point out the one-on-one -on -one correspondence. It also depends on how much hearing the child has. So for example, a child who's using American Sign Language ASL has its own grammar, its own structure, so you don't have as much one-to-one -one correspondence. You don't speak at the same time. If you're using signed exact English, you, you have the grammatical piece. Um, and if the child has some hearing, then it's also going to give them another just tool to help them decode the actual sounds of the letters. Um, there has been some research to show that deaf people do use phonetic information to decode. Um, if, whether that's through some lip reading or just word knowledge, um, that that is something that's useful to them. Working with young children um, under age two, age three, we're not at that age really working on reading skills yet, but we're doing a lot of pre-linguistic skills. So how do you hold a book? What is a book for? Um, can you get information from it? Um, there's a story, there's a sequence, and so all of those are things that you can do just through building up their language. Other things um, are just knowledge of sentence structure, so we have parents not only just telling kids, but trying to pull information out, asking questions, and so they're familiar with the different structures of our language, whether it be English or if the family maybe speaks another language, it would be similar. So I would just say the, the stronger the child's language is, the more people they have the chance to communicate with, the larger vocabulary that they have, and also a familiarity with print through books. Um, using lots of printed words, having a lot of visual print in the environment. So labeling, uh, like our classroom, we label things with the printed word and also sign pictures. And families can do the same things in their home. They can label things with words. And make sure that reading is really shown as a priority for the family and for the child. So having books around, having magazines around, having the kids actually seeing parents read and say, oh, I'm, I'm reading the newspaper, or I'm reading the story, and this is what it's about, to get them curious. Also, reading to kids is really important. Every day, um, I encourage even our parents with, ha with very young babies to sit with them with a, with a book and through the child's childhood to, to continue that, even as kids are starting to read on their own, to continue to read to them and keep them interested in wanting to know more from print. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, to follow up the previous question, uh, we figured out the acronym. Um, I'll repeat the question. How effective is the high-risk register for newborn hearing screening? Well, so risk factors is, is what you're talking about. So there used to be a school of thought that used a set of risk factors to determine which babies 
would be screened and which babies did not need to be screened. This was many years ago. And what they found was that by using that um, set of risk factors, they were still missing 50% of babies born with hearing loss. And so um, if it's all you've got, it's maybe better than nothing. Um, but that is why the United States and California specifically has gone to a universal hearing screening method. Um, and that's why all babies um, now need to be screened prior to being discharged from the hospital because we know at that point if we just use risk factors as our sole determination that we're going to miss half the babies born with significant hearing loss. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I wanted to ask a question myself of um, Melissa and Halissa, Halissa from CEID about the um, the use of iPads with family members, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about some of the other kinds of information that parents have been using um, the iPads to access, and also if it's been part of any of the visual inter interactions for children. I mean, there's these issues about screen time, and I know, Halisa, you were giving us lots of good examples of um, interaction with printed word around paper, and I'm just wondering if there was any of that in the use of the iPads with family members. We use the iPads in a lot of different ways at the school, not only on home visits, for information, but we also, for example, try to get the kids maybe to work on fine motor skills with the iPads. And so we have different kinds of apps that we can use to work on cause and effect skills. And some of these are, are through just word of mouth. And um, we also had a parent here several years ago who was a video game developer. And she actually developed an entire app that was aimed towards kids who had disabilities 18 months to four years of age to use as a communication device. So um, it had pictures where you could tap on it and make sentences, sort of like a communication board, um, but it was really geared towards younger children. So we've introduced those to some of the families as well. and. Um, we use them in the classroom as well. So we have several we have several kids here who have visual impairment as well as hearing loss, so they're deaf blind. And so anytime there's something that we're doing that may might be too far away for them to see, pictures, um, a video that we have smart boards in our classroom, a Promethean board. And so when anytime we're using our boards or pictures, the children who have Vision loss also use the iPad so they can interact with it up close. So that's just another way that we can use it that way. We also use them in our in our speech sessions, and um, it's really easy to have a whole slew of materials of um, vocabulary representation that you can pull up any kind of picture you would want to find. You could just use Google Images even to find a picture if there was a way that um, we're working with the children. We also have children here who have um, autism. So if there's a, like for example, the PEC system that uses actual printed pictures, um, there are iPad adaptations of those same programs. And so we often use those in that way. And some of our families do end up getting iPads through their child's IFSP or IEP through uh, an AAC assessment. And then those kids have their very own iPads that they use at school and at home to communicate with their families. Great. And just a quick follow-up to that, Halisa. Um, could you name some of the apps that you use on the iPad? Sure. Um, one that I really like is called Peekaboo Barn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, those are great for just the cause and effect where the for our young kids where they're learning to actually touch using one finger isolating fingers and then something happens an animal jumps out and they get to use they get to hear different animal sounds so that's a really nice one there are some really nice I'm actually I've got an iPad right here I'm just gonna take a look at it and name some of the apps because sometimes I'll just say oh it's the one with that one picture <laughs> okay so there's um looking at Toka Tea Party, 
And there are a lot of apps that have animals. There's one called I Hear You. It's E-W-E, -E, like the animal, and that's really nice because kids who are just learning to recognize sounds, we often use animal sounds because vowel sounds are easiest to hear. So that's another one that's nice. Another one is called Speech with Milo, and it's about it's prepositions. And so that's another good one that is often used in the speech sessions. Social, there's social stories also that we use, and there's one called Going Places, and it talks about what do I do, how do I behave when I go into the grocery store, or when I go into different situations. Um, hairdresser, mall, doctor, playground, grocery store, and restaurant are just some of the different places where you can see a social story. And so sometimes kids who are deaf and hard of hearing, they don't get these little nuances of how do you act with people and how do you make these greetings exchanges. When, you, when somebody comes to your house and knocks on your door, you know, you say, hi, how are you? Um, there's another one called My Play Home, and it's a, a free app as well. And it's Light, L-I-T-E, My Play Home Light. And there are different sounds that you can hear around the house. <laughs> So like the water running, or you can touch it and turn the TV on, or you can turn the oven on, and you can move people around. And so that's another good way that you can talk about situations. Uh, like, oh, look, Mommy is getting some watermelon out of the refrigerator. Now Mommy's eating it. And you can actually put the watermelon in the, in the mouth of the mom. You can pour cereal and hear what it sounds like to go into the bowl. And so those are all really good ways that parents can talk about language using the iPad without having to actually get out the bowl of cereal, without having to run around the house and turn on the faucet and things like that. Um, I'm looking at another one right now. It's called Hello Day. And it also goes through, you know, getting dressed, waking up in the morning, playing with toys, cleaning up your house. So those are another way that you can teach a lot of vocabulary and talk about daily sequences that kids really experience every day and give them the vocabulary that they need as well as do some listening exercises. That's great. Thank you so much. Melissa wants to add something as I, well. This is Melissa. I wanted to add a few things to that. Just that there are some apps for, like for my daughter who has a CI that like listening apps and they're really fun and interactive for the kids so that they want to do them. There's one called Splingo where it tells them what to do and then they build a rocket ship and there are other ones like that. I can't think of the names right now. Um, but we use they use a lot in speech and they're fun for the kids and so it's a way that they learn but they're still having fun and that makes it that made a big difference for my daughter. Even still does that it has to be fun for her to learn. That's great. And play-based learning, as we know, is really where it's at with kids. Um, wow, this is great. And um, I, uh, our time is up for the webinar, but I do want to encourage anyone who's interested to um, either make contact to our presenters through Hesperian. The email address is right here. Or, um, you know, or feel free to also reach out to the different organizations to CEIT. Um, I want to take this moment to just again thank our presenters Lorraine Brock, Kalisa Katz, and Melissa Lopez for sharing their time and their experiences with us. Again, um, and did want to explain that this webinar has been recorded and uh, we will be sending out uh, a link to that recording in case you'd like to share it with others or play it again or play some portion of it again for your reference. So um, we thank you all for joining us and uh, thanks again to our presenters. Take care.